Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 41, Remastered, which will cover the topic of the biosphere and ecology on a planetary level. Today, I'm going to talk about the interconnected nature of all of the world's ecosystems. I'm going to talk about the biosphere as the thin shell of life that clings to the surface of our little blue world. These topics can't be fully explored without discussing the impact that humans have on them. How human, industrial, and agricultural activity is affecting the world's ecosystems and all of the organisms within them. So, what is an ecosystem? An ecosystem is the sum total of all of the living things in a geographic region and the abiotic elements of their habitat, like the soil, the terrain, and the climate. For example, the Arctic ecosystem includes all of the polar bears, some seals, caribou, and Arctic birds, and all of the ice, tundra, lichen, and treeless mountains that they walk on. The Amazon rainforest is an ecosystem of incredible diversity, with thousands and thousands and thousands of species of plants, bugs, vertebrates, fungus, and all kinds of microbes that blanket the landscape and all of these are thoroughly washed in tropical rain and saturated with regular, heavy sunlight. The Sahara Desert is an ecosystem defined by a brutal lack of water, with sparse life scattered across the sun-blasted sand dunes and fields of exposed mineral rock, uncovered by any type of soil or sand necessary for many plants and animals to survive. In the last few episodes, I've talked about animal behaviors, about population behaviors, and about community interactions between different species. All of these interactions, all of this organic behavior, all of this life, perpetuates itself in a self-reproducing tide of carbon. And an integral part of this perpetuation of the biomass includes the cycling of nutrients and abiotic resources. Such cycling keeps ecosystems stable, which maintains a degree of similarity across time that acts as the theater for evolution. Perhaps the most important part of studying ecosystems is studying how these nutrients and resources are cycled across time and across geographic space. The food web is a great concept to touch on here, because it shows not just how nutrients are shuttled across a community of species, but because it also shows how energy, chemical energy, is moved and recycled and used to perpetuate species and support habitats. The movement and transformation of this chemical energy is the fundamental axis upon which all life develops, as all life requires energy. Cells need energy to engage in cellular respiration, and to reproduce and grow. When cells reproduce and grow, complex organisms which are composed of cells will also grow. It takes a lot of energy to sustain this growth, and to fuel the extremely energy-expensive act of reproduction. Autotrophic organisms, like plants, are those that absorb energy from inorganic sources, like the sun, or a deep-sea hydrothermal vent. Okay, so we have an energy input, and we have autotrophic organisms that convert that abiotic energy input into a more organic, bioaccessible format. If you imagine a flat, empty expanse of land, that land will receive energy when the sun shines on it. The sun's light and heat will warm the ground during the day, and the ground cools off at night. How much it cools is often dependent on the local humidity, because water has a high heat capacity and it traps heat in the atmosphere, but that's another topic that I, I don't want to get into right now. But anyway, this is basic energy input to a terrestrial ecosystem. Now imagine that this flat expanse of land has undergone a primary succession, and so you have grasses and small plants extending across this flat expanse of ground. The ground itself won't be warmed as much, because the plants will absorb the great bulk of this incoming light energy. Because these autotrophs convert inorganic energy into bioaccessible chemical energy, they're called primary producers. They are the primary producers of chemical energy, because they convert that inorganic energy into a digestible, physical chemical format that other organisms can integrate into their bodies. They can metabolize it and process it. 
And when you take into account all of the chemical energy produced by these plants that are absorbing the energy from the sun, you get the gross primary productivity, or the GPP. If you subtract the energy that the plants need to sustain themselves and to grow, you get the NPP, or the net primary productivity. The NPP is the important variable here, because the NPP is the total amount of usable chemical energy that's contained within the plant's tissues, within their biomass. When an herbivore eats a plant, it absorbs some of the chemical energy in the plant's biomass, and it uses that chemical energy to sustain its own body. Then a predator comes along and eats the herbivore, and the chemical energy moves from the herbivore's body into the predator's body. The energy is moving across the food web. In this way, the NPP, or the energy that's contained in the biomass of all of the primary producers of a habitat, this NPP determines how much energy will be accessible to every other organism higher up in the food web in that particular region. Ultimately, the NPP determines the maximal extent of the ecosystem as a whole, because it's basically setting the opening parameter of how much energy is available from day one, you know, from the start. So how much energy exactly do primary producers produce? Well, first, you have to consider how much light energy they're being exposed to. In equatorial regions, there's a lot of sunlight, and in the polar regions, there's extreme seasonal shifts in sunlight, and during the winter, where there's little to no sunlight for weeks or months at a time, the potential for plants and other animals to live here is greatly reduced, because these abiotic factors make this habitat a lot harsher. There's simply not enough energy coming in to sustain a whole lot of vegetation. So, of all of this incoming energy from the sun, the autotrophs can only absorb a limited amount of the energy for various reasons. Plants have pigments that can only absorb energy from a few wavelengths of light, and the amount of energy conversion depends on the amount of other resources available, like water. To keep it brief, autotrophs generally turn only a very small fraction of this incoming light energy into chemical energy. It's something on the order of... 1% efficiency. Now this is just the GPP. As the plants grow and their cells perform cellular respiration, they'll necessarily burn energy. They'll burn energy just to sustain themselves. And a lot of this energy is lost as heat, which radiates away into the atmosphere, or the ocean, or whatever. Something like less than half of a percent of the incoming light energy will ultimately get converted into chemical energy in the plant's biomass. And this is the NPP. Even though less than half a percent is very little, the raw quantity of incoming energy from the sun is so high that even this little sliver that we call the NPP is still enough to support the hugely complex ecosystems that we see around us. So this net energy, the energy itself of the NPP, is now in the biomass of all of the primary producers in the ecosystem. This energy, having been converted into sugars and then metabolized into derivative carbon compounds, literally composes the bodies of all of these plants that have settled our flat expanse of ground. Now, all of this vegetable biomass will get consumed and broken down by two other groups of organisms that are present in the ecosystem, called consumers and decomposers. Organisms that eat another organism are consumers, and there are tiers to this too. Primary consumers eat plants, so your typical herbivore would be a primary consumer. Secondary consumers eat the primary consumers, so a wolf would be a secondary consumer because the wolf eats the moose, and the moose is a primary consumer. And then you have tertiary consumers, which eat the secondary consumers. And this would be something like a bear attacking and killing and eating a wolf. It's important to understand that organisms aren't fixed into one tier or another. Humans can simultaneously be all three. If you eat a salad, you're eating plants, and that makes you a primary consumer uh, for that particular meal. If you eat the flesh of an herbivore, like a cow, for example, if you have a steak or a hamburger, then in that moment you're being a secondary consumer. If you eat a predator, like tuna fish, or a bear that you got on a hunting trip, you're a tertiary consumer. 
The same thing is true for any other animal. If a bear catches and eats an elk, then the bear is being a secondary consumer. But if it catches and kills a wolf, it's being a tertiary consumer. It's basically a situational term to describe the relative position of the eating animal relative to the animal that's being eaten. Decomposers are much more straightforward. The decomposers eat dead and dying biomass, or detritus, and they break it down on a chemical level. Decomposers usually take the form of fungus or bacteria, and as they eat the dead tissue of a plant or an animal or another fungus, the dead tissue basically dissolves. It decays rapidly, and the nutrients and chemical energy gets leached back into the environment. As the consumers eat plants and each other, and decomposers eat dead tissue, they take in the energy and the nutrients that are present in the biomass of their food. When you look at these relationships from a wider perspective, you start to see the food webs and the emergent patterns of energy flow from primary producers to tertiary consumers. Things start to get really fascinating when you analyze various aspects of these food webs in various habitats. In forests, for example, most of the biomass by weight exists in wood. Wood isn't really eaten directly. It's mostly softer plant tissue like leaves and herbaceous shoots that get consumed. And because of this, as little as 5% of the chemical energy in a forest gets eaten from living tissue. The vast majority of the chemical energy is eaten by decomposers as they break down the wood of a dead tree. So basically, the hard woody tissue of the trees in a forest contains most of the chemical energy, and a relative minority of the chemical energy in the ecosystem is what's actually actively exchanged on a day-to-day -day and week-by-week -week basis by all of the smaller, softer organisms living and eating and dying on the surface. The trees themselves grow and live at a much slower pace. And when they do eventually die, it takes fungus and bacterial decomposers a long time to break down this dense column of chemical energy. Now, in ocean habitats, the primary producers are mostly algae, not woody plants. This algae gets eaten alive way more often than wood does, so up to 40% of the total biomass gets eaten while it's alive. Instead of 5% of the chemical energy uh, in, the, in the forest, 40% of the total biomass, the chemical energy in the ocean, is cycled relatively rapidly by the living organisms that are living and eating and dying. All of the non-living stuff, like dead leaves, dead trees, dead algae, and dead seaweed that seem to carpet the floor of every habitat, they all get slowly broken down by decomposers, who do their stuff quietly in the shadows of the ecosystem where things aren't so fast-paced and uh, vicious as a predator mauling an herbivore. And yet, despite its subtlety, this energy transfer among the decomposers that are breaking down the dead stuff and returning it in raw chemical forms back to the ecosystem, this decomposing represents the vast bulk of the total energy flow in any given ecosystem. When you look at a typical animal, you see that it eats something, like plants or prey animals, and it digests the biomass to derive energy and nutrients to sustain itself. But just how primary producers don't convert all of the energy they're exposed to into chemical energy, consumers aren't able to digest and metabolize and utilize all of the energy that they consume. Some portion of the energy in the food is not used. It just gets excreted as waste, as feces. Decomposers will typically come along and break down the residual chemical energy in the feces, which is why horse manure is often used as a fertilizer. Decomposing bacteria chemically break down the manure from the inside out, and this releases nutrients into the nearby soil. Thus, horse manure provides the nutrients that plants can use to grow. Anyway, clearly not all of the energy that's consumed by a consumer is discarded in its waste. Of the energy that it does absorb and utilize, the majority of it gets used for maintenance and cellular respiration for sustaining the biomass that's already been grown and that already exists and that needs oxygen and sugars right now in the, in the perpetual present moment. The last little sliver of digested energy, typically a single digit percent of the total energy consumed and utilized, that gets used for growth 
and reproduction. This general pattern creates a kind of energy pyramid. You have all the energy produced by plants and other autotrophs like that, then they get eaten and a fraction of that energy, usually around 20%, goes up into the next layer in the food web. It goes up to literally compose the bodies of the decomposers and the primary consumers. As these organisms get consumed by the secondary consumers, about 15 to 20% of this energy goes up another level in the food web. Then the tertiary consumers come along and eat the secondary consumers and derive about 10% of the energy that's present in their bodies. And this means that only about 10 to 20% of the energy in any given level of the food web will actually make it up into the next level. This is why there can be a huge number of plants and a large number of herbivores, but predatory populations tend to be pretty small. There simply isn't enough chemical energy available at that upper level in the food web for the secondary and tertiary consumers to sustain large populations. Fundamentally, it's why predator populations are smaller than prey populations. Of course, like everything in the natural world, this varies from species to species. The larger mammals can retain heat better than smaller mammals, so the larger ones tend to be more energy efficient. The same is true with reptiles and other cold-blooded organisms, who don't really bother using chemical energy to stay warm. They rely on the sun for that and a hot rock to lie on. And so, biochemically, they put a lot more energy into growth and reproduction. Alright, so now that I've explored energy flow and the trophic levels of the food web, it's time for me to step back and expand the scope of my analysis. What does this energy flow look like on a global scale? Let's say that you and I are aliens on board a spaceship, and we're orbiting this curious planet Earth to study its life forms. If we were to look at the net primary productivity, or the NPP, of the planet Earth from space, we would see several distinct patterns. First of all, NPP in the oceans is low. Really low. The water absorbs light pretty quickly, and the wavelengths of light that are used in photosynthesis are only able to penetrate just a few meters into the water. This upper zone is called the photic zone, and it's pretty limiting because there's no land for plants and stuff to grow on underneath the photic zone. Because the only biomass is some algae that's scattered through the water, there isn't much biomass at all, and so NPP is necessarily really low. It's a bit higher on the ocean floor where all of the detritus accumulates, especially in areas with warm water currents nearby, but the primary producers who live on the ocean floor are chemoautotrophs. They depend on the chemical energy from deep sea vents, and so NPP in the oceans remains low. The only areas of the ocean that have a high NPP are coastal areas, or shallow areas, where the floor of the ocean, or the lake, or whatever body of water it is, where the floor is still in the photic zone. This allows marine plants and photosynthetic protists to grow on the seafloor because they're still within the photic zone. But when the seafloor descends away into the deep, and these particular wavelengths of light can't come in anymore, the vegetation cuts off pretty quickly. It's a different story entirely when we focus on dry land. On land, plants and microbes can grow freely, and the NPP can be quite high. In places like the Amazon rainforest and the jungles of Mesoamerica and Southeast Asia, these regions receive a huge amount of sunlight and water, and this stabilizes the temperature and nourishes the plants. These factors contribute to the growth and the proliferation of the primary producers, and so it makes sense that the NPP is really high. But in contrast, there are areas on land with really low NPP, as low or lower than your average oceanic NPP, and this includes most deserts. The Sahara Desert in northern Africa, the Gobi Desert in Central Asia, and the hellish Australian outback are all regions of the planet where conditions are not favorable for life, and so NPP is low. In these scorching hot deserts, there's too much sunlight, and there's too little water, 
The sun bakes everything during the day. And because there's no humidity, all of this heat radiates away at night, and the deserts become extremely cold. These extreme day-night temperature fluctuations are difficult, if not impossible, for most plants to survive. And as a result, all of these areas have little to no plant growth, which means little to no NPP. The Australian outback and the edges of the Sahara have some sparse vegetation, like grasses and shrubs that dot the landscape, but the Sahara itself, the core of the Sahara, is just raw sand with dunes hundreds of meters thick, where no life can live at all unless it's clinging to the edges of an oasis. The most you'll find are extremely hardy species of lichen and grasses that grow in small, sad little clumps here and there in the sand. Essentially, the NPP of any given region is the result of a confluence of several abiotic variables. You have the incoming sunlight, the available water, and the daily and seasonal temperature. The sunlight is the raw incoming energy that's used by the primary producers. So when this is limited, everything else is limited. But water and temperature also play critical roles. And if water supply and temperature are at an extreme, life can suffer. The deserts have just as much sunlight as a tropical rainforest, but the tropical rainforest gets seasonally swamped in rainwater, while the desert experiences little to no rainfall over the course of a year. Plants can't grow very well in regions that are too hot or too cold, which is why NPP is low in both the high Arctic and the Antarctic, as well as in the deserts, scattered around 30 degrees latitude in the north and south. There's one other critical variable that also influences the NPP of all of these regions, but I haven't really gone into much detail on it yet. That variable is nutrients. In all ecosystems, nutrients can be found in bioaccessible and bioinaccessible formats all over the landscape. And nutrients are also held in organisms' bodies, and shuttled around the food web through consumption. As decomposers dissolve biomass, nutrients leak out and saturate the nearby soil, where plants and fungus can absorb them and put them back into the cyclical food web. In the oceans, this leads to low NPP, as the nutrients fall far out of the photic zone and get deposited in layers on the seabed. But near the coastline, these nutrients are in the photic zone, and they can be used to feed plants and support dense animal ecologies. Furthermore, smaller bodies of water like lakes and ponds will undergo upwelling as the temperature changes across the seasons. And this works literally like a flush or a pump that moves up and redistributes nutrients throughout the body of water. In rivers, nutrients in the soil, or those released from decaying organisms, be they plant or animal, get flushed from one region and moved downriver to another region, where they are often deposited. They can be deposited as silt along a riverbank, or they can move out of the mouth of the river and be deposited in a larger body of water, like a sea or an ocean. These nutrients are really interesting, because fundamentally, they're just atoms, like carbon, and nitrogen, and phosphorus, and sulfur, and thus, they aren't destroyed or consumed and eliminated. Nutrients exist forever. The only thing that changes is the biomass, or the chemical compound, or the organism that those nutrients happen to exist within. For example, consider your own body. In your own flesh, you have carbon, and oxygen, and nitrogen atoms. And these atoms have existed since they were created in the forge of a dying star. And over the course of billions of years, they've been shuffled through an uncountable number of organisms and environments. The oxygen atoms in your body have likely been part of a water molecule, which was consumed by an organism and broken down through metabolic processes, only to be reconstituted in the organism's flesh for a brief period of time before being reconverted into another water molecule. The carbon atoms in your body have been cycled through even more organisms. Perhaps some of your carbon was first picked up out of the soil by a plant and integrated into its leaves, 
An herbivore came by and ate the leaves, and that carbon became part of the herbivore's body. And then a predator came by and ate the herbivore, and the carbon became part of its body. And then the predator died, and its body was decomposed by a fungus, or a bacterium. And the carbon was either absorbed for some time inside of a bacterium, or exhaled as carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere, where another plant might have absorbed it and start the cycle all over again. And this would happen countless times across the half a billion years since the Cambrian explosion. And the whole time, those same carbon atoms, those same oxygen atoms and nitrogen atoms are all being used and recycled. And right now, for a brief period of time, some of those nutrients are embedded within your body, and they're composing your organism. All of the atomic nutrients in your body have undergone billions of these transitionary steps, in millions, if not billions, of cycles. These nutrients currently reside inside of your body, inside of your cells, that compose your enzymes and your DNA and your cellular membranes, and they're involved in cellular signaling and all of these other things that keep you alive. But as you eat food and excrete waste, even the atoms that compose your body are slowly recycled. Perhaps the carbon gets shuffled off your body in the form of a skin flake, or a hair that fell off your head. Or, most commonly, the carbon is removed from your body in the carbon dioxide that you exhale. Perhaps this carbon is present in your body when you die, and when you decompose, it'll return to the soil to be used by new plants and animals. This is the fundamental cycle of life, the perpetual recycling of nutrients through millions and billions of organisms over hundreds of millions and billions of years. You only borrow these nutrients temporarily, for just a fraction of your lifetime, before giving them back to the world around you. And in this way, your body is kind of like a Theseus's ship of atoms, perpetually being rebuilt as parts are perpetually lost, or excreted, or exhaled. All organisms are like this. All living things are like a chemical eddy in the planetary flow of nutrient cycling where the eddy temporarily hangs on to a few nutrients to sustain its form before dying and letting them go back into the greater flow of things. To understand these nutrient cycles in more scientific and uh, less poetic words, we can break down a nutrient cycle into its basic steps. First, you have uptake and consumption, and then death and excretion, and decomposition. Decomposition is the most important step in this cycle, because without decomposition, everything else kind of grinds to a halt. This is really evident when you compare two similar ecosystems with one critical difference, like a boreal and a tropical forest. Both ecosystems have extensive vegetation, composed heavily of trees and other woody plants, but one is warm year-round, and the other undergoes seasonal periods of extreme cold. In the warm, humid, tropical forest, decomposition happens relatively fast, and it goes on all year. If something dies at any point in the year, it will generally be dissolved really quickly into its base nutrients. It'll be dissolved within a few weeks, if not a few days. In some cases, when you're talking about small organisms in a particularly warm and humid environment, you can count the number of days it takes for them to fully decompose and disappear on a single hand. The heat, the high humidity, and the species diversity encourage this rapid decomposition of any available corpses. But in the colder, boreal forests, decomposition is much slower. The abiotic environmental conditions aren't necessarily as conducive to chemical reactions. You know, there's less heat, there's less incoming energy. There's also less species diversity and a much lower annual humidity. During the cold months of the winter, plant growth and decomposition both slow to a halt. The chemical reactions just simply don't have the energy to keep propagating themselves when the ambient temperature is 20, 30, or 40 degrees below zero. So what's the end result? In the tropical forest, the dead biomatter, or the detritus, will form a relatively thin layer on top of the inorganic mineral bedrock. 
This layer of detritus is relatively thin because it gets dissolved so fast, and the rapid growth of other organisms demands an equally fast rate of nutrient uptake. So there simply isn't enough time to build up a thick layer of detritus, because everything that dies gets really quickly broken down and perpetually cycled back into the ecosystem super quickly. But in the boreal forest, way farther up north, the lower rate of decomposition means that detritus layers can build up and up and up, sometimes many feet thick. If you were to take a shovel and dig into this soil, you would find a thick, dense layer of detritus and peat before you ever reached the inorganic mineral crust that underlies everything. I've made a point this episode of emphasizing how abiotic cycles affect ecosystems, specifically variables like sunlight, water, and temperature, which can cycle seasonally. While the food web is a fascinating and complex mechanism for cycling biotic nutrients, the physical and geochemical properties of the planet itself have a massive influence on the cycling of abiotic nutrients. These geochemical cycles operate on a planetary scale, moving water and nitrogen and carbon and other nutrients between and across ecosystems, linking them all together in a single, integrated biosphere. Consider the water cycle, which you probably learned about in grade school. When water is warmed by sunlight, or when water comes into contact with the atmosphere, it evaporates into the air as vapor. In places like the ocean, where huge expanses of water interface directly with the atmosphere, evaporation is so common that it outpaces rainfall. The net movement of water is actually up. Essentially, the ocean is like a cloud-generating surface. On land, evaporation is much less common, as there's obviously a lot less water. The evaporation from lakes and rivers barely compares to the evaporation generated by the oceans. But surprisingly, a lot of evaporation comes from plants, who lose water through their leaves by a process called transpiration. All of this evaporated water forms clouds, and the clouds get pushed along by the wind until they get so heavy that they burst and drop their water as rain. A lot of evaporated water gets rained right back into the ocean, but a healthy portion of it rains over the planet's continents, over its dry landmass. This precipitation feeds all of the plants that live on land, and it swells the lakes and rivers that other animals drink from, or swim in. As water saturates the soil and flows downhill, it'll carry nutrients with it back into the oceans in the form of sediment. The flow of a river can be remarkably influential on the local habitats and ecosystem, and vice versa. Think of the Nile River, which flows through an otherwise dry and inhospitable region of land. I mean, if you look at Egypt and you go outside of the, the large riparian flood zone along either side of the Nile, it's mostly sandy desert with very little vegetation. The Nile River feeds a dense, snaking biome of plants and animals that hug tightly along the riverbanks, and then at the, at the north of Egypt, where the mouth of the Nile feeds into the eastern Mediterranean, there's a giant floodplain, and the plants and animals thrive in this fertile floodplain region. Now, I said this can also work in the other direction. It, it can also work vice versa. The plants that live in a habitat can alter the density and the consistency of the soil. And that can influence how a river flows. A dense patch of soil can have a river flow around it as opposed to cutting through it. And so life can influence the environment just as the environment influences life. I just gave you one example, but there's many more. Fungi with their extremely thin hyphaea are able to grow within the cracks in rock, even between the grains in the rock crystal. And when they grow into the rock like this, they can enlarge cracks and even break the rock apart. And over time, this can reduce a large rock down to a handful of small rough pebbles. And of course, we can't forget the evolution of photosynthesis, which produced so much oxygen that it ended up killing most of the oxygen intolerant life that was alive at the time, but it ushered in a whole new era of oxygen breathing life that we are currently enjoying right now. 
The fact that life can influence the environment, just as the environment influences life, is really evident when you look at the ecological relationships between predators and their prey. More predators means that their prey populations shrink, because you have more predators getting more kills on the prey population. And if the predator population is large enough, this can quickly outpace the birth rate of that prey population. When these prey populations shrink, the plants they eat will thrive, because they're not being eaten so much by this one particular herbivore. So all of these thriving plants that are now under less uh, pressure from being eaten, they might attract other organisms like beavers, who dam up rivers and create standing lakes and ponds, which can attract amphibians and insects. So you have life building on the behavior and existence of other life in this compounding way. But all of this growth needs more than just water. The water cycle works in concert with the nitrogen cycle to propagate life. Most nitrogen on the planet exists in the atmosphere in the form of molecular nitrogen, or N2. However, molecular nitrogen has a triple bond that isn't easily broken, and as a result, most organisms are unable to access the, the molecular nitrogen in the atmosphere, they can't metabolize it because they can't break that bond. This nitrogen makes up some 78% of the atmosphere, but plants can't absorb it through their leaves or break it down with enzymes. Only a small fraction of organisms, like nitrogen-fixing fungus and bacteria, can convert this molecular nitrogen into ammonium or nitrate ions. Ammonium and nitrate ions are more bioavailable formats that plants and animals can access, they can metabolize them, they can metabolically process them. Once the nitrogen has been fixed into this bioaccessible format, it's absorbed by the plants, it can be absorbed through the plant's roots. The vegetable biomass of a given ecosystem is a major nitrogen reserve, as the pigments involved in photosynthesis require a lot of nitrogen. Now, animals require a lot of nitrogen, too, as it's integral to our amino acids and to our DNA. And so, when these plants and animals die, with their cells packed with nitrogen, all of this nitrogen is one of the many nutrients that gets broken down and leached back into the soil. Sometimes, this soil-bound nitrogen gets washed away in the rain, where it ends up feeding marine ecosystems. Here, it gets incorporated into marine plants and marine produce and animals, who will also die in turn and release that nitrogen once again. All of this death and the release of all of this nitrogen back into the substrate feeds a host of microorganisms. These microscopic decomposers derive the energy from the nitrogen compounds that they find in detritus, in dead biomass, and through their metabolic processes, they can break these compounds down and, as a waste product, produce molecular nitrogen, that gets released as bubbles, comes up to the surface, and makes its way back into the atmosphere. Essentially, the nitrogen cycle is perpetuated by microorganisms, those who fix molecular nitrogen from the air into a chemical format that other organisms can use, and those who take nitrogen out of the dead and decaying matter and respirate it back into the atmosphere. The last major cycle that I want to cover today is the carbon cycle, which goes through its cycles much faster than nitrogen. Carbon exists in the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide, and photosynthetic organisms like plants and algae take up this carbon dioxide as food. They break down the carbon dioxide to extract the carbon atom, which gets integrated into the plant's biomass, into its tissues. As I've already described in detail, carbon gets cycled through the food web as herbivores eat the plants, and as carnivores eat the herbivores. But carbon is also cycled through respiration. As animals exhale, they breathe out carbon dioxide. Naturally, this exhaled carbon dioxide will return to the atmosphere, where it can once again be absorbed by plants or algae. The carbon can be cycled quickly between organisms, between the plant that inhales it and the animals that exhale it, which means there's relatively little carbon left in the transit stage. The vast, vast bulk of the world's carbon exists in the life that swims in the oceans, or the life that walks or grows on dry land. And of all of this life, the vast bulk of that carbon 
exists in microbes and microorganisms that live as aerosols in the atmosphere, or that live super deep in the soil, or that live on the surface and in the bodies of all the other living things. Human activity, like industry and our agriculture, is destabilizing these natural cycles, taking just a couple centuries to introduce a degree of chaos into a planetary biosphere that's been stabilized by millions of years of evolution. It will take tens or hundreds of thousands of years, if not millions of years, for the world ecology to find another stable point after humans have gone extinct. For example, our agricultural fertilizers are putting huge amounts of nitrogen into the soil, and while some of this soil nitrogen gets blown in the wind up north where it promotes plant growth, the majority of it gets washed down by rain into rivers, which get dumped into the oceans. This nitrogen dump can have hugely negative effects, like algal blooms, and the subsequent emergence of dead zones. There's also the fact that industrial agriculture often strips the nutrients out of a patch of soil, and thins it out and makes it much less able to support life. These unsustainable farming practices are destroying an extremely valuable natural resource, that is, soil, because soil takes thousands of years to be generated. It takes a long time to produce, and so the fact that we're just burning it up so quickly is incredibly reckless and irresponsible and destructive and damaging to the ecosystems. Our industry is pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere at unnaturally high rates, which causes devastating changes by altering the climate. And even though plants might theoretically enjoy a little bit more carbon dioxide, they certainly do not appreciate having their seasonal cycling tampered with, and the temperatures they're exposed to pushed to the extremes. An increase in carbon dioxide is an increase in a potent greenhouse gas, which causes the planet to experience warming and unusual weather patterns, as well as long-term climate shifts, like the warming of the planet. The worst-case scenario is called the clathrate gun hypothesis, where excess carbon dioxide warms the oceans to a point where the methane clathrates in the seabed melt or dissolve, and it releases all of that methane into the atmosphere. This is called a clathrate gun, because methane is way more potent of a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So methane's release and mass from the seafloor will rapidly accelerate the effects of climate change. It'll be exponential, like a gun suddenly blasting off. I'll talk about all of these changes and how we can prevent the worst of it in the next episode on biodiversity, climate change, and the conservation of our natural world. As for ecosystems and biosphere ecology, I think I've covered all the basics pretty nicely. I hope you learned something cool about how the natural world works on a planetary scale, and about how the physical, geochemical processes and biotic cycles are integrated into a total, singular biosphere. I also hope I was able to make you think about how animals and plants interact with the world around them, about how they grow and live and die and evolve in regions with varying levels of sunlight, varying levels of rainfall, and an extreme range of temperatures. If you liked this episode, hit the like button. And if you want more of this awesome biological content, hit subscribe and check out some of the other cool videos on my channel. And as always, thanks for listening.